Hey, uh, just a quick intro before we start the interview with Vince. Uh, the I was recording his audio and picture on one using one program and my picture, my video on another program. And shortly into the interview, the program recording my video crashed. So I'm going to do the best I can. We have the important thing. We have the audio and Vince's video. And I'm just going to do the best I can with my picture. So bear with us and hope you enjoy it. Here we go to the interview. Thanks. Okay, so I want to um, thank my sp extra special guest, Vince Kreckler, uh, to this episode of the Pokey Popcast. Uh, Vince is a well-respected judge. He has judged at all levels of Pokemon, from uh, the smallest up to one of the groups of, of uh, at Worlds, um, and uh, everything in between. He also is a, uh, for years, has been a PTO, and with PTOs going away, he is still one of the few people who are running regional championships. Uh, he yes. Has, he has a regional championship in St. Louis upcoming in um, February. And with the really great news that he has got Pokemon to allow him to bring back uh, not just the Professor Cup, but also uh, the Professor Seminar. Two things that we really, really missed this past year. So thank you, Vince, for uh, working with Pokemon to bring those things back. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, they'll allow us to record some things so we can get them out either through the Poke Popcast or, or through so, some other method. Uh, because the more information we get out to judges, the better. Anything else you want? Uh, Vince is also the guy behind uh, Yeti Gaming. He is the Yeti. Uh, I'm, my son is the Yeti. Close. Okay. And uh, and and Vince um, Vince actually got into uh, running Pokemon events and judging Pokemon events. Speaking of your son, uh, because when your son was playing, uh, well, why don't you tell your story? You, you you tell it better than me, I'm sure. No. And once again, thank thank you, Mike, for having me aboard on the cast and looking forward to this for a long time. This is just what we need in the community, more resources for judges to look at. Um, like Mike said, I've been doing this for 17 years. I was reminded today since my little boys were four and six and we went to a couple tournaments and had, let's just say it, it was a bad organizer experience where, we made a decision, either I'm going to start running these events or we're going to get out of the game. And 17 years later, I'm so happy that Pokemon allowed me to step up and help start running events and help just keep this game growing and the community becoming what it has today. I mean, I love this community. I yeah. love my store. I mean, I love my store, but it's just amazing to be with people like Mike, be with pe great judges all across the country that make this game great. And the shameless plug is, yes, there is a Professor Cup on Friday, February 16, 2018. Um, there's the Professor Seminar, also February 16, 2018, right before the Collinsville, Illinois Regionals. And we were just told that we are awarding a staff position to Worlds including airfare and hotel for whoever wins that Professor Cup on February 16th. The good news is I'm not playing. I don't get to add a first place trophy to my second and third. Mike is a former Professor Cup champion. so I never got He's first place. So I've gotten um, top 16, top 8, uh, fourth place, and third place. So I'm shooting for second and first. All right. Yeah. Well, I've got two. I've got a two, three, and a couple sixteen. So I'm gonna have fun running it. We're bringing back a lot of things that make the Professor Cup great too, such as the junior judges and all sorts of other stuff. And in the symposium or the seminars, we're call, calling it, we've got some great judges coming in to speak on topics that I think are going to be relevant to everybody. Mike's agreed to come in and speak. I've got Corey Scott coming in from Ohio to speak and. I'm going to be speaking a bit, and I'm excited at the direction everything feels right now. Very good, very good. I'm looking forward to it. I really, I really missed having that uh, this past year. Um, both both events, both the seminar and and the professor cup. I think uh, it left a big hole in the uh, in, in the judge community. Really missed it. So I, I think they'll be uh, happy that uh, they they have an opportunity to to come back and and participate in these things. So uh, what we wanted to talk about today. 
Uh, specifically, uh, one aspect of, of cheating and problem playing, because I want to be very clear on this, uh, we're going to be talking about slow play. Uh, a player can slow play for a couple of different reasons. Uh, and actually, I, I got a couple of formats here we'll, we'll go through, but I just want to start with this. Just because somebody is slow playing doesn't necessarily mean they're cheating. And just because you feel they're not cheating doesn't mean you don't call them on slow play. Uh, I always use the example. I was speaking of the Professor Cup. I was playing in the top 16 of the Professor Cup a number of years ago. And I had a complicated deck. And my opponent, had I had like 16 different options of what I could do. And I'm trying to think two or three turns ahead because I was playing against a difficult opponent, John Silvestro. And uh, I was just taking too long thinking about what my options were. And uh, and Rich, Big Daddy Snorlax himself, my my teammate on Team Compendium, called me for slow play, <laughs> and uh, told me told me to uh, improve my pace of play and, and start playing faster. So it's not about you know you can be friends with somebody they don't think you're cheating, but if you're playing slow you got to call them on it and and, uh, and and that's an important thing to be aware of. So uh, so Vince, I guess uh, the first thing we want to talk about is what is slow play. So could you give me your take on, on what slow play is? Yes. I mean, there's Pokemon is a game where there are multiple ways to win, multiple ways to lose, multiple ways to draw. And a clock is one of those options where slow play is taking advantage of time in such a way that your opponent does not get their fair allocation of time, taking actions that are too long, turns that are too long. And not, that doesn't say you have to rush through every decision you make. But there are times where you hear people, I won game one and I put the brakes on on game two. Or I realized in game three there's no way I could win and my only chance was to go for a draw. I mean, there's all sorts of scenarios where you look at it from a competitive player's point of view and there are many times when slow play comes into play. And is it slow play? Is it stalling? I think there's a lot of times when slow play and stalling are the exact same thing. Much more difficult to call stalling, but I think we're going to see that more and more as we march forward. Well, I, th I think if we can just get judges uh, calling slow play more than they have, I, I think it'll be a big step forward because... Right now, um, and, and there's been a big change in the penalty guidelines recently where Pokemon changed, put in, in a line specifically saying, call slow play, if, you, if you're calling it the second time, immediately go to a prize penalty. Don't keep warning, caution, warning again and again. They want us to, to pull the trigger on higher penalties to improve this. Pokemon has sent a very clear message. I think, uh, I think we covered a bit why it's bad. Well, actually, no, we haven't. We, but before we call, cover why it's bad, there's one thing I do want to also make clear. You mentioned about playing for the draw. It is it is possible for a player to legitimately play for the draw by making moves that are defensive rather than offensive. Absolutely. And, and that's legitimate. So I want to make sure that we're, we're going to be talking at a, a high level here. This is not just your basic entry-level we're, we're going to get into some meat and bones here for, for, the, for the listeners. So as part of that, it's important that, that judges realize that there is a distinction and there are legitimate ways to do things and illegitimate ways to do things. And, and if a player wants to play for a draw, they can play for a draw through legitimate means by playing defensively, putting up that wall of a Pokemon, uh, using healing, uh, max potion, using energy removal from their opponent so their opponent can't attack. Uh, but all of that has to be done in a timely manner. And the slow play issue is not that you're playing defensively, but that you're playing, you're taking too long to make your moves. You're doing the same thing again and again, looking at discard piles, you know, all that kind of stuff. Those are not legitimate. And, and that's a big distinction that's important for, for judges and, and players to, to be aware of. Right. And the guidelines give us the 15 seconds per action, the 10 seconds per action. And as judges, especially as judges of high-level players, we understand the first time you're going to go through your deck, you're going to be looking for how many double colorless are prize and all the other points you have in your deck that you need to look for. 
the first search of a deck may go a tad long, but there's a difference between a search going a tad long and somebody taking three minutes looking through their deck. There's a, there are times, mid-game, late-game, when you need to count something in your opponent's discard pile, and that's fine. Count it, review it once, but when I see people going to a discard pile two and three times on consecutive turns, you just have your spidey senses just completely go off. And you're going to hear this from me a lot. When you're looking at slow play from a judge's perspective, look at it from the opponent's perspective. What would you be feeling like if you were sitting there as the opponent when this is happening to you? I mean, that's one of the major things when I look at slow play now. And we'll go into some things later in the conversation about different techniques they've used and I think are being pushed forward and are going to be successful. But the one perspective I've gotten over and over again is, how does it feel being sitting there when your opponent's doing these motions? Mm -hmm. And I'll do another one of my favorite ones. It's 15 seconds per action from time to time. But there are players who will put the card out on the table but not really play it and pull it back and make a decision and then take 15 seconds for each one of those actions. Legitimately speaking, it's 15 seconds for a game changing action. So if they're putting it out but taking it back, then they haven't really done the action, right? So so they don't right. they don't get 15 seconds for each try at an action. They get 15 seconds for the action, period. Yeah, they don't get 15 seconds per contemplation. Yeah, and 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 it's an important thing now You'll, you'll get players, and, and it's also in the guidelines, uh, or, or if, I'm not sure actually if it's explicitly said in the guidelines, but if a player is timing to use the maximum amount of time every time, that's also an issue, right? Oh, absolutely. My favorite defense of slow player stalling is when somebody says, well, I have 15 seconds, and you're sitting there staring at them going, that is, once again, you look at, the spirit of the rule, not necessarily the letter of the rule. Mm -hmm. The timing guidelines are there to make sure that both players get a fair chance to play their game. Right. And when one player is explicitly taking and taking and taking, you can see it on the opponent's face. You can always just see there's a problem coming. And as judges, I think we are going to get better and better at the higher level events of putting a stop to this. I mean, very difficult to do when you've got 900 plus players like they did in Memphis this weekend. And that's becoming the norm rather than the exception for some of these super tournaments. At these big events, and, and there's one every month now, sometimes two. Right. And that's why, I mean, from an organizer, I get to put both hats on. As an organizer, what's my duty? My duty is to make sure I have enough judges on the floor to give my judges a fair shot to make that tournament fair. We're projecting 30 Masters judges for Collinsville, Illinois. Sorry, Mike, you're not one of them. We're putting you in a different division. But 30, 30 in the Masters division. Okay, that's good. I have, I've been in Masters just about every tournament recently, so it'll be fun to be with the younger players. So so we're kind of talking about why why slow play is bad, and, and you're talking about how it feels to be on the other side. Uh, I, I think um, one thing we also want to, is that if, if you're playing the tur trading card game online, uh, that has a clock that each player gets, right? So each player gets to use up a certain amount of time. And we don't have a chess clock like that in the, in the, in the trading card game live. Right. Uh, just right. because it's just not economically feasible to get all these uh, chess clocks out at either all the local events or, or have 450 of them for, for uh, a regionals. Um, but one of the things, one of the points of that, which does apply to the trading card game, is that each player deserves to have a fair amount of the time of the game to attempt to win that game. And by one player eating up the time by making non-productive, I won't even say game actions, just non-productive actions that aren't even game actions, they're taking away time from the opponent to have a chance to play their game. And, and so that, that's why it's, it's so critical that we, uh, as judges, put a stop to slow play as much as we can. Uh, so let's see. The other thing I want to talk about is the different age groups. So 
you'll you'll hear a lot of judges saying, "Oh, this is juniors. I need to give um, a lot more leeway in how we handle things with juniors because they're kids." Uh, what's your take on that? Once again, sit in the opponent's chair where we have situations where you'll have a junior who maybe they're very basic and maybe they don't understand or have the ability to shuffle or things like that. That shouldn't be held against the opponent. If anything, it puts a strain on the judging staff knowing you've got to put a judge by little Timmy because he's going to raise his hand like my sons did for years with that magic call of judge shuffle. But for juniors especially, it can be more of a problem because you're really disallowing the other player to have the full time to play, and you're discouraging the other player the whole time through. If you're asking my stance on it, my stance is the same yardstick should be used in juniors, seniors, and masters. Because in allowing a junior to get used to doing something improperly, you're setting a bad precedent for seniors and masters. What I, and as soon as I say it, am I going to say, but for the very young player, would I give an extra warning, an extra reminder? Yes, which is going to go against something we'll talk about later in the conversation. So for that very fell off the turnip truck, brand new player who's just getting to experience the game, number one, I'm hoping we're not dealing with them at a regional. I'm hoping we're dealing with them at a league challenge or a pre-release where we can teach them the proper way to play the game. But if I've got them in a regional, there's big money on the line. There's points on the line. And that young junior in taking up too much time, if it's allowed to continue, could legitimately cost their opponent a chance to win some of the substantial prizes on the board. And we're talking some big money right now. Let, let me ask your, your take on, on this aspect. Um, instead of looking at it as an age thing and giving a benefit of a doubt to uh, the junior, look at, at, at an experience level thing where uh, the inexperienced player, whether they're a junior or a master, is going to be making more mistakes, is going to be taking more time to figure things out because they got to read the cards or whatnot. And what you're going to... My my thought on that is that if they're playing at the lower tables, because generally the inexperienced players are going to be playing at the lower tables, I think I might be a little more forgiving uh, in terms of timeliness, and you know I may give an extra warning at that placement. But if they're playing at the top tables, or even the the tables that are in contention, the mid the mid tables, depending on on where you are in the tournament. Um, I, I, th I think uh, they need to be held to that tighter standard because they are, as you say, impacting people's ability to earn the prizes that they're there to earn. Does that sound That's reasonable? That, that sounds right, which means the leniency really starts in round four or round five when they're really sitting at one and four or O oh and four, as opposed to sitting there in a con even two and two isn't out of the aren't out of the events anymore. We've seen so many players in all divisions get Superman syndrome and go from two and two to seven and two. And now they're sitting in contention. Mm -hmm. So I would agree exactly with your assessment that in the lower tables where it's played for fun, that's fine. But I also still look to see if the opponent's being upset by that pace of play. And we see it from not only the young player, the, I think your, your take on experience was perfect because a lot of times it's the pokey parent. It's the parent of someone whose their kid has gotten them to play. We want to make it a positive experience, but it's going to take them a little longer to feel their way through a deck. Right. That's, that's a good point. We, I, I always want to look at this as a customer experience. And you want, we want those players coming back. We don't want to be chasing players out. But on the other hand, we also don't want them negatively impacting other players when when prizes are on the line. So it's a bit of a balancing act and, and a bit of it a is. time that judges need to walk in that regard. Um, it is. It, and that's that comes with experience. I mean, a lot of that, and that's, I think, what you and I are doing on this cast, and I love your previous cast for doing it, 
because having done this for almost two decades, like we both have, I think you probably have hit the two decade mark. No, well, the game started in, I, I started in the game in 1999, so we're we're not quite there yet. Well, my son turned 21 last year, and the game turned 21 on his birthday. So, yeah, my son was born on the same day as Pokemon. Um, <laughs> so, but no, getting back, getting back to topic. Um, it's just very entertaining to see how the experience as a judge allows you to walk to those lower tables and still make sure everybody's having a good time, fun, but the time pressures aren't quite as there, as much there. But when you're dealing with the higher tables, you really have to do it as if you're making sure the game is fair for both players. And I think that's the ultimate job as a judge is you want the game to be decided at the tables, not because we let somebody get away with it or somebody got away with it. We want the game decided at the tables because somebody had a better hand, somebody had a right. better strategy, somebody had a better idea. Right. And and I think that that's a critical thing. And that, that I think, guides a lot of how Pokemon handles things, so, somewhat in, in, to their detriment even in the past, because they'll, there's a number of judges who over the years have gotten a little shy about actually giving significant penalties because they, you know, they do have that mantra of we want it decided at the table, but they don't take into account that that only goes so far. It, it, you want it decided at the right. table, unless somebody has messed up, and now it's unfair for it to be decided at the table. And I think our term we use is battle scars. You've got them, I've got them. We've all got times that we, we really feel like we should have pulled that trigger on a call, and we shake our head and go, why didn't we? Because we were lenient, or we didn't fully see the situation as it happened. Um, so, I mean, we refer to that as just battle scars in the judging yeah. community. But I think I think anyone any judge who has not made a mistake is not being honest with themselves because I know I I've, I've made a couple of doozies in my career. Let's let I want to jump back to slow play for a second. It was really entertaining and really illuminative to go over to Europe and judge in the European Championships for the international this year. Why? Because Chaitin, who was the overall head judge, really laid down a policy that opened my eyes. There are no more cautions or verbal warnings for slow play allowed in Europe, period. If you're walking to a table and every judge up and down the ranks was instructed this, if you walk up to a table and you believe that the player is playing at an improper pace, you are to give them a written warning. And so, so, what, so to, to contrast with what has been happening here, what has been happening a lot has been uh, walking up and saying, I need you to improve your pace of play. And, and, right. that's, and that's not even a verbal warning. It's, it's a pre-warning. It's a precaution. It's, it's just a suggestion to the player, which if it's not followed, might be followed up later on with a warning or whatnot. But it's basically giving the player a free non-warning. There's nothing written down. It's not on their record it's not es there's nothing to escalate from because you haven't actually given a warning or a caution yet right so so this is basically right. going straight to a written penalty and and is it, is it a caution or it's a warning or does it depend on it's the actually, level of play it's actually a warning it's a warning every time for slow play because what was explained was that mike i might walk over to that table and say come on guys pick up the pace you've got no way of knowing i did that you do that, then other judges come over and do that. And by the time we start getting irritated and realize it, the player may have had five verbals before the first written warning. We were instructed a second thing in Europe, which I'm going to ask my judges to do as well, which is when you give the player the warning for slow play, they say, this is your warning for slow play. The next one will be a minimum of a prize penalty. If I truly felt that you were stalling, we wouldn't be dealing with a warning at this point. Mm -hmm. Because there's a major difference between stalling and slow play. Right. Well, let's, let's very jump true. back a bit, right? So, so we kind of jumped into what are we, what are we doing about slow play? Let, let's jump back a bit into how to identify 
what slow play is. So okay. you're a player, you're playing somebody, or you're a judge watching the match. What what are the things they're going to say to you, okay, I need to give a warning, or if they've gotten a warning previously, I need to escalate for slow play. What behaviors should people be seeing that are saying this is slow play? Number one is inaction. Even if it is active inaction, riffling through your own hand. Um doing that little trick where you put the card down to consider it then pick it back up that's my favorite going to a discard pile more than once on consecutive turns that's a big one in my mind that when you've hit that when you've hit your opponent's discard then you've hit it twice okay you found something you were looking for i will give you the benefit of that doubt the second consecutive turn you do that I'm going to still really start wondering what you're doing and counting multiple times. You count once for Garbodor. You count once to see how many double colorless energy. You count once to see how many Guzma have been played. You don't keep going back. So the major things I look for when I'm identifying slow play walking around as a judge are those multiple actions. The second thing you look for is the look on their opponent's face. There are a lot of opponents who will literally tell you with their eyes, I don't know what's going on here. And yes, there are opponents who will bait and use that. You have to be careful as a judge to make sure you're seeing what is actually a problem. Right. My all-time favorite is when a player calls me for slow play, I stand there and watch the table, and I find out the opponent's playing slower than the, the person who called me is playing slower than the person they called against. Right. You'll literally stand there and look for multiple repetitive non-action actions. Or worse yet, and unfortunately for a lot of venues, including the big boys, only one player can see the clock really watching that clock. And I think it's unfortunate, and there's an argument in our house, even our household right now, I think if all players can't see the clocks, the clock should not be displayed. That's actually one of the things I discussed with um, Dave Schwimmer at uh, when, when he was at um, Hartford a couple of months ago um, about calling time, giving out time. And his feeling was that it's fine for people to know time as long as everyone knows the time. Exactly. And, and if, if only a few people are going to know the time, then that's a problem. And we've actually done that. In our events now, we call time at 30 minutes, we call time at 15 minutes. And if a player asks a judge and it's below 15 minutes, we'll tell them it's less than 15. We won't tell them 10, 5, 2, everything like that. Mm -hmm. But we will give players, trading card game, 30 minutes left in your round. Right. Players, trading card game, 15 minutes left in your round. And we argued about those times in our little circles. But 30 minutes is a wake-up for most players that the match is timed. If you haven't gotten through your first game, you've only got a half hour left. 15 minutes is another one that says the match is timed. You don't call one minute or two minutes because that's when I think you'll get the players really grinding to a halt. But we actually found a decrease in ties when we called 30 and 15. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly allowed within the rules. I've kind of gone back and forth over that uh, with on that over the years, and initially I had been, you know, not not giving out time at all, and then I'd been, you know, give anyone whatever time it was, and and I, I think now I'm I'm kind of where you are on giving some landmark times, and and not uh, not the detail, um, uh, but as as long as uh, unless unless there's clocks up where everyone can see clocks and then everyone's got the same advantage of knowing the time. So, so I think we're, we're on the same page on that as well. So let me run this scenario by you and get your, your thought on it. Um, player takes an extended period of time thinking. It's, it, it's maybe a key play. I, I've been in this situation myself and I'm playing and I'm thinking through a few different strategies of I could go this way or I could go that way. So maybe they're taking 20, 25 seconds to think through a few different options. But then they make a number of moves in quick succession, and, and then their turn is over. 
So they spent a good bit of time thinking through, but then when they, when they were implementing their, their strategy they decided upon, they played promptly. What, how, how, what do you think about that? Is that a problem? Is that not a problem? That, I believe in the key, having played at the highest level, like you have at certain tournaments where you know your decision on one turn will make or break your game, I'll let that go once. If I can really see them doing exactly what you said, do it, then do the few actions afterward. If it becomes an actual pattern, the second turn they do it in a row, you may see me drop that warning for slow play at that point. I believe players have the right to think, but not to think to the detriment of the game. This is a game that is decided not only by the skill of the players, but players being able to think out their strategies and implement them within a set amount of time. Time is a factor in all things here. I do believe that, just like in chess, you're going to have that turn where you really need to make sure that your plan is going to move forward. But you don't get to work on it for three minutes and then work on it for three minutes next turn. There's a reasonableness standard. But exactly what you said, if, what I, saw, if I saw what happened there, I might stick around and watch and see what happens next turn mm -hmm. and see if this was that one key turn they needed to set their plan into motion. So would I fire off right away? No, probably not on the first shot unless it was absolutely egregious. But I will say this, I probably wouldn't give, if I would, even when I decided to give the warning, I probably wouldn't give the warning until the player had made their next play. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in disrupting the thought process, which could cause it all to cascade backwards, or for a player to blame you, they lost because they forgot everything they'd figured out. Right. Well, I think that's an important point, and, and we're, we're jumping off slow play here for, for a second on this. I, I've seen some judges refer to, or players complain about judges picking up a card in the middle of a turn to look at the card or asking or asking or telling the player something in the midst of their turn and 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 I think it's important for judges as much as possible to refrain from doing anything like that because these players can be very intent it's a very intense situation and they're very intent on on the actions they have to take and and it's very critical for judges to not do anything that's going to derail their train of thought, if at all possible, to avoid that. Um, had had some judges, there were dis there was a discussion on whether to use smartphones. You know, should judges have smartphones out on the floor? And one of my points was, well, of course, one of the things I use my smartphone for is if I want to look at a card I'm not familiar with, or I want to reread the attack or or the ability because I wasn't quite clear on what was happening there. I'll pull it up on my smartphone, either at the uh, Poke Gym uh, Researching Tower or there's a number of other sites that have card databases and, and pull that up and look at it on my phone rather than potentially disrupt the match by picking up a card and looking at it. And aside from that, if what, let's say I'm wondering, how come he's not using the ability on that card? If I were to reach out to, you know, maybe I'm not thinking of the card, the ability correctly. If I were to reach out and pick up that card to read the ability myself, I've now suddenly brought attention to that card. Right. And he had neglected it and forgotten it was there. And now by me bringing attention to it, I've effectively coached him. So I think judges... Intentionally, can... intentionally or unintentionally, without one bit of bad faith, you have affected the game. And I refer to really good judges as glorified furniture. And I tell this to any judge I'm coaching on table judging. You can be friendly with the players. Keep them loose until the moment they flip over those starting basics. And then you, a good judge in my mind, is silent. A good judge is making sure every players are right, that the second supporter doesn't get played. You do what you have to do as a good judge to the best of your ability. But that's when the friendliness and everything, you can still be friendly, but not be, I guess, personable is the word, where you're talking with them through the match. And I've sat there with those headphones on, as have you, 
where players are talking back and forth through the entire game, and it's so tempting to add in your own quip. Mm -hmm. But I always smile and tell, tell people, tell all my judges, you've got the best seat in the house. The players have earned the right to sit there. In many ways, it's an honor for you to be watching that game and making sure it gets decided at the table. But right. So I never, because players will talk for all sorts of reasons. And some players will talk as a portion of slow play. By the, while they're talking to their opponent, nobody realizes 20 seconds have gone by and nobody's done anything. Right. So getting back to slow play here, that's a good segue back into it. So we've, we've identified it. We've identified that the person is doing something that's slow playing, either shuffling, shuffling their going through discard piles, just chatting away and not actually doing anything. So what should a player you're, you're their opponent. What should the opponent as the player do about it? And when, when a judge is either watching it or is brought over about it, what should they do about it? They should talk in very particular things. My, it's not my, play, my, my opponent's wasting time. It's judge. My opponent went through the discard piles three times last turn as well. He takes... 15, 20 seconds every time he looks at it, he'll put it down, then he'll pick it back up again. There's more specifics you can tell a judge about what has got you upset at the situation, the better off you are. And it's infamous for players, high-level players, to say, we don't call judges on slow play because they won't do anything. Because a judge many times feels they have to see the play to issue the warning on the play. But... What players have to realize is once you've complained about a player for slow play, you may not get that immediate gratification of that warning being dropped, but that player is now going to be watched. And you don't always get to see, you don't always get to see the watching. I may walk over and tell Mike, hey Mike, there's a slow play on request on 17. I'm see I'm not seeing it right now, but walk over there in a, in a couple minutes or a couple seconds and see what you think and if it's there drop that warning because of course when a, when a player's standing there only an idiot slow right. plays right in front of a judge I, I think that's a really good point I, I i don't i guess maybe players are not aware that judges are doing this and and maybe that's because judges hopefully are doing it well if they're doing it and 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 that's always a thing i when i when i do train people on this i always make sure to that they they're aware that if you're watching somebody you never watch them from where they can see you watching them. Right. You always want to be out of their line of sight, in their blind spot, and certainly not standing right behind them, but rather standing a row back or even two rows back and off, not directly behind them, but off where you can kind of see what's going on here. Uh, and, and that is if done well then then the player should not be aware that they're being watched because as you know if they're aware they're being watched they're an idiot if they continue with the bad play right and it's just something that the more a player can communicate with the judge especially if they feel there's an issue i like it when players come up to me between rounds going i didn't call a judge but please keep an eye on this it would it just felt bad all round and I don't think players realize judges don't mind being communicated with. Right. We'd, we'd rather know an issue and help stop an issue than allow the issue to continue and somebody go, well, I lost the tournament, but it wasn't fair. Right. That's, that's kind of a, always a stab at a judge when the players walk away feeling like it wasn't fair. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point about the players realizing that we may not take action on the – initial report, but I would say of the past three or four people that I've either disqualified or given major penalties to, it was a player shared with me what was going on, or, or I saw something going on, but not enough to call it at that point in time. And, and this is important advice for judges, is team judging. Get other people to watch, because if you're always there, that, that could be a, a signal to the player you know, hey, this judge is watching me. But if other judges are, are watching at different time and there's a trade-off, 
uh, where one judge is watching at this point in time, another judge is watching it at again, and then a third judge is watching it again. Not only are you increasing the chances of seeing the bad behavior and being able to call, to, uh, call on it, uh, but you're also getting multiple judges reporting the same bad behavior. And then right. you're, you're definitely out of the, oh, he has it in for me, he's always out to get me, well, we had three different judges observe the same behavior, and and so that's not the case. So it's it, much easier to deal with parents when you're doing well. Right. Well, I saw your son. Well, I wasn't the only one who saw your son or daughter who was doing this type of action. So, no, well, that's where team judging really comes in handy, especially on these gray type calls. Is because. How often do people really get thrown out of tournaments for slow play? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the examples I gave were more toward the cheating side of things, but the the concept is the same. We'll, Absolutely, we'll look and watch um, to to see if we can observe either slow play or bad shuffling or cheating of some kind. All those things are are things that are are behaviors that are easy to miss if you don't catch them at the right moment. And so by having multiple judges looking for it, and, and if players give judges the heads up of, hey, and, and, and I don't know, if, and I guess players are not aware of this, players should be aware of this, when we have between turn meetings with judges, that's part of what's discussed. This player was uh, the opponent was complaining about slow play. Can we keep an, Can we keep an eye on him next turn to see if he's repeating that behavior, and quite likely the head judge will assign somebody to keep an eye on that player. Right. So I think players need to be aware that while they may not get an immediate satisfaction of getting that call immediately, and they, and they may with, with the tighter uh, implementation that we're looking at now, but even if they don't get it immediate, it, it will follow that player through, through the tournament, or at least for the next few rounds, to see if we can observe that behavior again and, uh, and hopefully um, issue a penalty to correct it. Right. The other thing that I would want to make sure that everybody knows is we're going farther and farther in all of these big tournaments and small tournaments alike about making sure the penalties are tracked. So once Jimmy has a warning for slow play. The object is to get it to all the judges in that division as quick as possible. So the second time Jimmy gets a warning for slow play, it's a prize penalty. The second time there's an issue with drawing an extra card, whatever it is, we constantly, as organizers, one of our goals is to really make sure every one of these penalties gets put in everyone's hands so that we don't have people getting multiple warnings. And if there are areas we are truly trying to track crack down on for the good of the game, that they're going to be cracked down on. We're going to make it more difficult, not easier, for players to, quote, get away with things. Right. And and we're rolling out things. Are you good at planning on using Carlos's um, online penalty tracker? Yes. We're planning on having iPads in the hands of all the leads and seconds of every division in St. Louis or Collinsville. Right. So, right. And and so so for, for players to be aware of and, and other judges at, at these big events. So you know you may not see it out of your league challenge or your league cup, at least not yet. But at these big events, uh, Carlos Peros who's who's worked quite a bit on um, on on programming a number of things to help make tournaments run smoother. So thank you, Carlos. Uh, one of the things he's he's rolled out is uh, this penalty tracker system, which as penalties are, are typed into the, um, the, the computer, uh, they are fed back out to a, um, basically the judges out, in the, uh, out on the floor can, can enter in uh, the player's player ID number and see what their penalty history for the event is. Yes. Uh, so really make, make it a lot easier than the old method of somebody typing them up, print, printing them out, handing them out to everybody, which was always a couple of rounds behind. Uh, so th this should hopefully get that information out to the judges in, in a real-time basis and, and make it possible to uh, 
as you say, to not let somebody get warning, 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 and not have it escalate. Right, and I think we're seeing that. And Pokemon is jumping ahead of the other games in this. I mean, Carlos, and I'm going to give credit to his wife as well, Dana Perro. I mean, we're seeing things with online, online deck registration that just succeeded for a 1,000 players in um, Memphis, which will also be used coming up in Collinsville. Um, the penalties, first with penalty slips, which seemed to be a simple addition to get the penalties in faster, and now the whole penalty system. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much we're moving this game forward leaps and bounds. And Mike, this is where I'm going to give you credit, my friend. This is this type of podcast and this type of information being disseminated is going to make it much easier for judges to be more consistent throughout this country and this world. Right. Well, that, that's huh. not, basically been my whole mission for Pokemon is consistent judging. Uh, from That's why we started the compendium, because, um, you know, initially – Judge would rule that uh, Chansey's double edge didn't hurt himself or God knows what and and just getting those cons consistent rulings. That's why you became a judge because your son wasn't experiencing cons consistent judging. Right. So th that's that's what our, our whole um, mission has been. So we want to keep moving that forward. And if I could just uh, and if I could reiterate back to slow play. When, people, when judges are looking at slow play, whether it be at a league challenge, league cup, all the way up, I like the written warning first system that, was, that is being promoted at this point. Not giving people the free pass. Not giving people the one, two, three verbals. And I, I think everybody should consider that as a best practice for slow play. Because... A warning, yes, it's written, yes, it's tracked as a part of your record, but if you're playing cleanly, it's not going to affect the rest of your event. Playing cleanly is the clearest way not to get penalized. So if you did have a moment where a judge thinks it's slow play, great. And you keep consistent throughout the rest of the event, you're not going to have an issue. Failing to do it on this on the other side and allowing a player to continue to slow play over and over and over again without repercussion or significant penalty is just a negative for the game that we don't need. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that's where Pokemon is heading, where we're we're being stricter in, in the enforcement of these things, not just slow play, but drawing an extra card. Um any other misplay where uh, things need to be the written warning, not the verbal warning, and the escalations happening because there's more prize money on the line. Uh, unfortunately, players right now are, are are feeling things are being allowed to got, be gotten away with that shouldn't be gotten away with. So we we need to make sure that we're um, giving players uh, that they have full faith in the game that that and, and that's that's the main thing we want to make sure that events are fun fast and fair and right now there's a feeling among a number of players that the fair is a little bit we want to make sure that we get them feeling that that um that when they come to a pokemon event uh things will be fair and they'll have a, a good shot at doing well okay, and not based on somebody taking away their opportunity unfairly. I agree. And I think we're, I think the tide is going in the right direction. I think we feel a lot of positive things right now, both in the Pokemon community and in the judging community, that these things are being taken seriously, that there is more push to get information out to all judges. There's more push with the symposium, or the seminar, I keep calling it a symposium, the seminar coming up in St. Louis, um, and more push for with the levels that have been created in Pokemon with the basic stage one, stage two, that judges are seen as having a path to succeed and improve. And I know just like you, I look forward to helping Pokemon improve that moving forward into the future. We are right at the tip of the iceberg of making this to be a great experience for the players. And for mm -hmm. the judges. So every judge who can, head out to Colling Collingsville, Collingswood? 
Collinsville, Illinois. It's right outside St. Louis. I'm going to say some more. I'm going to say St. Louis because that's 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 uh, that's the the big city. <laughs> so head out to St. Louis for the regional in uh, in February, mid February fifteenth. What what day February, is the February sixteenth is the judge seminar in the Professor Cup, and we will be giving away those GX tokens. It's a free it's free for the participants and for participants of either the seminar and if you're a stage one professor, you can also participate in the Professor Cup. We are giving away the special GX tokens like we did in Daytona. There's Professor Cup those. specific. Oh, that's great. I, I look forward to that. So is it Solomon Draft? Is that what we're going to be doing? I've, I have not. No, it will be It will be a constructed format. That will be released by the end of the year. Um, we're getting that all worked up, and the good news is I'm going to be the head judge. The person creating the tournament style can't be the person who plays in it. Okay, good, good. Because I th in the last few Professor Cups, things got a little bit too crazy in terms of the rules. So... I, I, I like that the Professor Cup has its own little idiosyncratic rules as long as they're not too crazy. So I, no, trust, this, I trust you to, to put it together the way it should be put together. You're not going to have to stand up and dance and do a Z move, Mike. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I don't think people want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I, I'm really looking forward to it. And, Mike, whenever you need somebody else on these calls, I'm happy to help out however I can. You know that, my friend. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, this is Pokey Pop on the Pokey Pop cast with our guest, Vince Kreckler. Uh, see you in February, Vince. See you. Thank you, Mike.